The chemical industry suffers from a very bad image. Everybody has in their mind images of massive industrial pollution, such as chemical spills, gigantic smoke plumes, or exploding chemical plants. In December 1984, a leak in a plant producing pesticides in Bhopal, India, released 40 tons of methyl isocyanate, a highly toxic chemical killing close to 4,000 people and injuring half a million. In 2010, an explosion, followed by a huge leak of crude oil from the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform, discharged 4.9 million barrels in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 people and putting at risk 400 animal species. More recently, in 2019, in Rouen, France, a fire in the Lubrizol plant created a huge smoke, black, odorous and toxic, that spread around 20 kilometers around, depositing black oily soot on the buildings, ground and vegetation, forcing the administration to prohibit farmers from harvesting their crops. On the other hand, chemistry clearly improves our daily lives in all fields, in the energy sector, in the new technologies, the buildings, the food industry, in the health domain. Without chemistry, we would not have fuel, we would not have smartphones, we would not have medicines, we would not have vaccines. When I was studying chemistry at the university in Paris, I experienced the same contradiction. While I was so exciting at working to develop new molecules that could potentially treat diseases, there was one thing for which I was not comfortable with. Manipulating toxic chemicals. A good friend of mine told me, be patient, soon you'll be a manager, other people will manipulate them for you. But I'd rather nobody manipulate them at all. That day, I questioned, can we suppress the drawbacks of industrial chemistry while continuing to benefit from its advantages? To address this question, let's take a closer look at chemistry. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the science that studies constitution, structure, properties, and reactivity of matter. What is matter? Well, everything that is around you. Your smartphone, your computer, your desk, your shirt, your cosmetics. All these nice items involve some complex chemistry at some point. Unfortunately, nature is not producing by itself all these items. Humans have to transform natural sources from the environment to, to produce some complex material and by combining them, it will produce some nice items with exhibit some appropriate properties. Producing and registering sound for your phone, solidity for your desk, therapeutic activity for medicines and immunity development for vaccines. One way of transforming natural matter into a material of interest is to make two natural matters reacting with one another. This will produce a third matter that will have different properties from the two original ones. By applying many transformations to various initial sources, we can obtain sophisticated material that will exhibit new and specific properties. This is what does the chemical industry to provide the materials that make up the consum consumer goods we use in our daily lives. Unfortunately, the chemical industry also has its risks. When something goes wrong in the plants that transform matter, it, in, it can have dramatic human and environmental impacts. Thankfully, these risks could be prevented or at least reduced. How? By gaining a better knowledge of these chemical transformations. And this is the thing I am going to try to explain to you today. But the task is not easy because in our daily life, we don't often see two matters reacting together. Yet, when it happens, it can be fun. One can observe lime or sodium bicarbonate bubbling when exposed to an acid liquid such as lemon juice. 
or red cabbage, changing color when exposed to a domestic acid or base, such as sodium carbonate, also known as washing soda. If I cut a red cabbage and mix it finely in the presence of water, I can extract a strong violet juice. This violet juice will change color when exposed to an aqueous solution of sodium carbonate. Beware, sodium carbonate can be harmful, so please don't try this at home. What's happening during this color change? Well, very small elements of the red cabbage, molecules named anthocyanins, will change structure when they come into contact with the molecules of sodium carbonate. The structural modification will change the way the molecules interact with light, which results in a change in color. Here, anthocyanins and sodium carbonate molecules are surrounded by thousands of molecules of water, meaning that they can move and meet very easily. We say here that water is the solvent. What would happen now if we did not use a solvent? Let's take a look at our example again. The mixture of red cabbage was dried out in an oven to remove water and poured over sodium carbonate. But nothing happened, no color change could be observed. Here, anthocyanins and sodium carbonate are in the, in the solid state and they cannot move freely. In consequence, they cannot meet and they cannot react. The water solvent, our matchmaker in this case, is no longer here to do the job. In a similar way, many matters used by the chemical industry are solids. Solvents are therefore needed and being produced at a very large scale. It is estimated that close to 30 million tons of solvents are produced annually. Unfortunately, unlike water, these solvents are often either volatile, volatile, flammable, or toxic and potentially very polluting. But guess what? Reaction can still happen without solvents. Solvents are absolutely not necessary for molecules to meet and react. You just have to mix them more efficiently by using mechanical forces. It is like hitting molecules multiple times with a hammer. Except we no longer use hammers, but ball mills. If we place the dried red cabbage and sodium carbonate inside a small reactor that contains balls made of stainless steel and if we place this reactor in a ball mill the movements of the balls will intimately mix the dried red cabbage and the sodium carbonate and here is what you get Dried red cabbage that you can see here on the left part of the image has been transformed into green cabbage. This experiment indicates that molecules can meet and matters can be transformed without solvents. Chemists working with matters that are very difficult to dissolve already know this very well. For example, Alloy industries are using huge ball mills, so big that you can go inside them, just like these pictures show. Unfortunately, the potential of mechanical forces is not fully utilized by the chemical industry. As a consequence, the production, usage and disposal of massive amounts of solvents 
could theoretically be avoided each year if the chemical industry would fully embrace the use of mechanical forces. At the laboratory scale, we've already had a lot of success. For instance, for the production of peptides, a class of molecules that, that are widely used in the food, cosmetic and pharmaceutical industry, such as insulin, a hormone that is used to treat diabetes, or for leprorelid, a peptide that is used to treat prostate and breast cancer. To produce many peptides, manufacturers are using tons of TMF. This is a volatile and reprotoxic solvent which can severely affect sexual function and fertility in adults as well as fetal development. In our laboratory, by using ball mills, we and other research group have shown that peptides could be produced in the total absence of this highly problematic solvent. Other research groups have already obtained very promising results by using these mechanical forces, such as our colleagues in Montreal for the processing of gold. Processing of gold traditionally requires the use of massive amount of very nasty acids, such, such as aqua regia, a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and hydrochloric acid to dissolve and recycle gold. By contrast, our colleagues have brilliantly demonstrated that they could make gold soluble in plain water by simply using ball mills and safe solid reagents. Ball milling is very efficient when dealing with hardly soluble solid, but it also works surprisingly well when dealing with gas. In these times of dramatic global warming, capturing and re reusing carbon dioxide is critical. Nowadays, one of the main ways to capture carbon dioxide is to make it react with volatile, toxic and flammable solvents named alkanol amines. But we've shown that carbon dioxide could also be captured without these nasty alkanol amines by simply using ball mills along with lysine, a simple and innocuous amino acid already produced at the industrial scale. Ball milling presents other advantages. Efficient mixing enables to reduce to the minimum the quantities of expensive chemicals. This has enabled us to easily access otherwise cost-prohibitive chemicals. Access to these chemicals have broken barriers in the way we analyze matters that surround us. For instance, we are now capable of providing level of details in the structure of some nanoparticles that were never even thought possible before. Nanoparticles are present in many objects and consumables in our daily life, such as paints or cosmetics like sunscreen. The development of such analytical capabilities could help us further improve our knowledge of their importance and mode of action. The processes I have mentioned are performed at the laboratory scale and require further developments to reach implementation in the industry. Yet, technologies such as extrusion have already been identified for upscaling. Extrusion is a process that compresses matter to give it a special shape, such as for producing minced meat or pastas, for instance. And this method is widely used in the polymer and in the food industry. However, extrusion has been overlooked by chemical industry until now. These techniques, combined with other environmentally friendly approaches and a better understanding of chemistry, could help create a much safer and cleaner chemical industry. A chemical industry that would benefit humanity without impacting the environment and the human health. Thanks for listening to me.